In this video, we are going to derive Stokes theorem in its common version and in the, the most general form that it can take. So what is Stokes theorem? It is a vector calculus identity that relates the integral around a contour to the area integral of a vector field over a surface that the contour bounds. So let's, let's kind of draw this out a little better. First here, we have a contour, which we will call C. And we have the area inside of it, which we will call S. So the identity that we're looking to derive is that the contour integral, the closed contour integral around C of some vector field, which we'll call A, that's the scalar product between A and the elemental vector along the contour, we are going to show that that is equal to the area integral over S of the curl of that vector field and its scalar product with the area vector. And in this 2D case that I've shown here, the area vector is out of the page. So to show that this is true for any piecewise contour C, we're going to break up this area into small elemental areas and then add them all back up to get this, this overall relation for arbitrary shapes. So we will zoom in here and we will assume that we've taken an elemental area that is small enough such that the curl of the vector field A is constant over dA. And the definition of the curl we will show here. This is going to be equal to dAy dx minus dAx dy, where we're defining a coordinate system here centered on this dA where y is vertical and x is horizontal. And when we say that the curl is constant, we mean that each of these gradients are constant over this area. So there's only a linear variation. This is a first order approximation. Now, taking the integral of the curl over this area, and we're gonna call it dA1 to distinguish it from subsequent ones that we're going to consider. And this is equal to the integral over that area of this gradient minus the integral of the other gradient. And we can express this as a double integral from x1 to x2 and from y1 to y2 of this gradient. Now in this case, of course, we notice that we're taking the integral of a derivative over the same variable. So this simplifies quite nicely to this expression here. Now we can do the same thing with the other gradient. This integral is equal to a similar integral to the one just above it. So now we can express the integral of the total vorticity. But first, to be able to, to make this clear, I'm going to do a little inversion here. So I'm going to separate these two terms out of the integral, and I'm going to flip the limits on one so I can flip the sign. So that looks like this. So I have, oh, let me, let me move that over. So from x1 to x2, we have this, and then I'm going to say plus from x2 to x1 of the other variable here. Now substituting this expression and this one as well, where we're going to do the same flip of the limits on the second ay term there, we get an expression over here. Oops. Yeah. All right, this is the area integral of the curl. 
is equal to, to this integral plus three more just like it. But before I write those down, let me show what it is exactly that we're doing. So we're saying an integral from x1 to x2 at y2. So perhaps I should label these over here. So this point on our grid here is x1, y1, x2, y1, x2, y2, and over here, x1, y2. Okay, so this integral here is actually an integral from x1 to x2 at y2. So we're at the top, going from x1 to x2. Oops, no, actually, let me, I've done that wrong. It uh, should be in the other direction. So let, let me just change these limits. Sorry for that. This one is from x2 to x1. And then we'll be adding the other one at y1. So that's going to be now from x1 to x2 going in this direction. So we're getting a, a counterclockwise integration, you'll see. So let me add these other two integrals. Scroll up. So there we have all four components. And if I draw these last two that I've just written, we see that we're completing this circuit. Okay, so how else can we write this? Well, we can write this in the standard form that I introduced at the very beginning. This is simply the closed integral over we'll call this C1, that's the boundary of DA, of DA1, and that is the vector field dot product with DL. So going back to our thing here, DL in this case would be some portion along here, And so we've recovered the form we had before, but so far we're only considering a very small area. And the reason that we needed to do this is in order to do this integration as we've done it, we needed to have constant gradients, only linear variation of the vector field over the elemental area. So now how do we put these together to get the overall expression so we can express this not for an elemental area, but for any area in general? So the way we do that is we are going to add up neighboring elements. So we have one element here and we have another one right beside it. We'll call these DA1 and DA2. And we're going to be performing this counterclockwise integration on both of them. And perhaps you see what's coming. As I do this, we find that on this interface between the two, we have one integration in one direction and one integration in the other direction. So with these two neighboring elemental areas, when we add up the contour integrals from C1 and C2, so this one is C1, this one is C2, we can define an outer contour that goes around both of these elemental areas as C12 and the integral, the closed integral over C12 of A dot DL is going to be equal to the sum of the two that we just did. Right, so if we broke this down into line integrals over each of the four lines because we're using these square little elemental areas. As I said, we would get the cancellation happening right here and right here. So we can just sum up the full 
contour integral around the whole thing here and the whole thing here. These two will cancel, and that is going to be equal to the contour integral around C12. And now that we can do this with two areas, there's no reason why we can't add a third and a fourth and a fifth, etc. ad infinitum, until we've built up a very large area. And so we come at last to the results that we were looking for. So we say that the integral over some large area C, which we defined at the beginning of A dot DL, is equal to the integral over the area that's inside of that contour of its curl times by the with a scalar product of the elemental area vector. So again, the area vectors here, if we define these as vectors, are pointed out of the page, normal to the elemental area. And just let me paste paste that image in again so we can see what we're talking about. Um, I realized that I called this S before rather than A, but uh, let's just call that A. And just to reiterate, we put this all together by actually summing up a very large, possibly nearly infinite number of small area integrals over DAI of, of that same integral. And that's basically it. This is this is our result. This is what we are aiming for. But there's one last thing that's worth pointing out, which is that consider the derivation path that we've taken. We haven't made any statements about the nature of this surface. So it's very often this is applied just for two-dimensional areas bounded by a contour that lies on a plane. But there's no reason that this couldn't also refer to any arbitrary contour in some subset of three-dimensional space and any area that is bounded by that curve. So let me sketch another example. If we draw a contour and imagine that this isn't actually just two-dimensional, but this is somehow occupying three-dimensional space. And then we can draw any sort of area around it. So this could look something like this. I'm going to draw a grid on it to, to make it clear. And we'll draw the cross lines. And what's amazing is that this same procedure that we described would work just as well on elemental areas that are put together into this complex three-dimensional geometry. It doesn't matter, in fact, that it's not lying on a plane. And I have to say, when I finally figured out what Stokes' theorem is really saying, that we can have any arbitrarily shaped contour, as long as it's piecewise continuous, and any area that's bounded by that, even if it doesn't lie in a plane inside that contour, this seems just impossibly general, but it holds. So you go through this derivation again and, and take a look, and there's nothing we've done that prevents this from holding for this shape that we've shown here as well. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, let me know if that was clear. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments. And thanks for watching.